Madeline Pryor has one of the most tragic origin stories in the entire history of Marvel Comics, and it all came to a head in a 1989 crossover event called Inferno, which coincidentally is also the last time that her character was actually significant in Marvel. But something to understand about Madeline Pryor, when she was originally introduced in Uncanny X-Men issue 168 back in 1983, one, she had no real origin story. All we knew between her original appearance and subsequent appearances is she survived a plane crash, which actually became a major plot thread later on. But the other reason why she had no origin was because she was supposed to be the reason why Cyclops was written out of Marvel comics entirely. He was going to be gone forever. And the reason why was because he was the last of the holdouts. As most of you guys know, Jean Grey had died at the end of the Dark Phoenix saga, sacrificing her life on the moon in Uncanny X-Men 137. But prior to that, the original roster of Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, which not only consisted of Jean Grey and Cyclops, but also had Beast, Iceman, and Angel, it had largely just kind of been taken apart. Beast had been put on the Avengers comics, and Iceman and Angel had been rolled over to a comic series called The Champions of Los Angeles, which was shortened to the champions. And so by Uncanny X-Men 137, with all that having happened and Jean Grey dead, Cyclops was the last man standing. And so in Uncanny X-Men 138, he left. He quit the X-Men entirely, and he ended up taking off to Anchorage, Alaska. But where in this day and age, you would see that be the end of it, right? He would just walk out the front door, the sad, incredible Hulk music playing, we'll miss you, Cyclops, never to be seen or heard from again. Chris Claremont was very, very big on treating comic book characters as actual people. And so an actual person wouldn't just walk out the door, never to be seen or heard from again in like a movie or a TV show or a soap opera or something like that. You'd follow their story. And so 30 issues after that, that's when you got the introduction of Madeline. Now at the very end of Uncanny X-Men 168, that's when she appears. And it's basically just her looking exactly like Jean and Cyclops completely overtaken by that. But between Uncanny X-Men issues 169 and 174, it's written like a soap opera. Cyclops is coming to terms with the fact that Madeline looks like Jean. They strike up a relationship pretty fast. And in fact, Cyclops tells her about Jean. He shows her a picture of Jean. And she's totally flabbergasted by the fact that she looks exactly like Jean. But then you start to learn these small little things about her past that lead Cyclops to wonder if there's something bigger going on. The most obvious example of this, which I believe was an Uncanny X-Men uh, 172 or 73, he actually goes to his brother Havoc, Alex Summers, and he asks him to dig into the background of Madeline Pryor's story. The reason why was because when Madeline Pryor talked about when she was in the plane crash and all that kind of stuff, that Cyclops realized she was in the plane crash the exact day and even the exact time that Jean Grey died when she was on the moon. And so it couldn't be any small coincidence. Now, Alex Summers ended up coming back and basically saying, hey, like, everything seems on the up and up when it comes to her. I can't find any kind of nefarious deeds going on. She's not lying about anything. Like, she seems like a pretty solid chick, right? And so what that did is going into Uncanny X-Men 174, and specifically 175, that in 174, Cyclops introduced Madeline to his father, Christopher Summers, who leads a group called the Star Jammers. They're like the Reavers from Guardians of the Galaxy in the MCU, basically space pirates. Also, his dad has a thing for furries, right? His girl's name is Hepzibah, kind of weird. But in Uncanny X-Men 175, this was kind of like the story arc that really led to Cyclops officially moving past Gene. Because between issues 169 and 174, not only was he struggling with whether or not Madeline's story was true, he was struggling with his connection to Gene. The feeling that he was betraying Gene by moving on with someone who looked exactly like her. Uh, the fact that he just had a very difficult time letting her go because Cyclops and Gene were true loves. Right? They were going to get married, right? Against all odds, they were going to have a life together. But again, of course, Jean Grey died. But Uncanny X-Men 175 was a story that dealt with the villain Mastermind in kind of an ironic twist because he was instrumental in causing the Dark Phoenix saga in the first place. But Mastermind had kind of tricked everybody into believing that the Phoenix had come back. And it was a pretty flimsy plot in terms of him, like tricking everybody into thinking Madeline was the Phoenix or Cyclops was the Phoenix and using his ability to control the five senses to get the X-Men to fight each other. The bigger takeaway from all of this was that with Cyclops being confronted by the Phoenix, 
he had to come face to face with his memories of Jean and the reality that Jean Grey was gone, that she was dead and she was never coming back. And so it was basically an in comic book way for him to just grieve and move on, something he had never actually done even in the time when he was by himself in Anchorage before he ever met Madeline. And so at the end of Uncanny X-Men 175, he finally says goodbye to Jean and he marries Madeline Pryor. Now in Uncanny X-Men 176, the very next issue, he kind of retires. And when I say retire, I mean he kind of backs away from superhero antics and focuses on his life with Madeline. But one of the things that's established is he has a very difficult time letting go. A whole plot thread that actually came to a head in Uncanny X-Men 201. And we'll talk about that um, here in a minute. But the difficulty that he had in letting go was the fact that so much of his life was defined by being an X-Man he didn't really know how to do anything else. So it wasn't that dissimilar from a person who works at the same job for 40 years, retires, and then doesn't know what to do with themselves. And so following that, there was actually a two-year period where you didn't hear hide nor hair of Cyclops or Madeline. And that was kind of normal when it came to what Claremont was doing because, again, he was in the process of writing them out. And so between Uncanny X-Men 138, when Cyclops initially quit, going all the way up to Uncanny X-Men 176, you actually saw him appearing in Marvel Comics less and less with each passing month, kind of acclimating the readership to seeing Cyclops essentially going away. Now, X-Men and Alpha Flight in 1985, that was a crossover event, kind of a two-part story that dealt with Loki being Loki and, you know, God of Tricksters and all that kind of stuff. The big takeaway from that comic in relation to Madeline and Cyclops is that in X-Men and Alpha Flight number one, she found out she was pregnant. And that's where the strain on her relationship with Cyclops really started to come to a head. And specifically, it happened in Uncanny X-Men 200 and then 201. Uncanny X-Men issue number 200 is an iconic comic book, a landmark comic book for a variety of reasons. It's the trial of Magneto in the sense that in issue 199, he handed himself over to the world court. In issue number 200, he was officially tried for all of his past actions. Professor Xavier kind of succumbed to an illness, ended up taking off into space with the Shi'ar to find some way of healing himself. And so it left no leadership for the X-Men or the New Mutants a role that Magneto stepped into at the end of the trial of Magneto. But in relation to uh, Cyclops and Madeline, two big things came out of this. The first was that Madeline ended up giving birth to her baby basically by herself, right? Because Cyclops was out there doing his X-Men thing. And it was really kind of establishing the fact that Cyclops valued his life as an X-Men more than he valued his life with Madeline Pryor, especially the fact that he was becoming a father. The other big thing is that he wanted to go back to being an X-Man full time because he didn't fully trust Magneto. And he thought maybe even potentially Magneto had killed Xavier. Now, the reason why that matters is because in Uncanny X-Men 200, it was believed Xavier was dead. And so everybody just kind of assumed he was done and gone, which just allowed a bit of a reprieve and for Claremont to dabble with the idea of Magneto basically leading the X-Men and, and so on and so forth. But this whole strain between Cyclops and Madeline and Cyclops' role as either being an X-Man or being a father and a husband, that was all played out in issue 201. This was the story that a lot of you guys have probably heard of where Cyclops fought Storm for control or leadership of the X-Men. And it was kind of his hand being forced by Madeline Pryor, that Madeline would constantly make this argument and saying, you're not an X-Man anymore. And even if you were, you're a husband and a father now. Those duties come first. Being an X-Man, that's secondary because the team doesn't need you anymore. They have all kinds of people on there and any number of them can lead. And so Cyclops fought Storm in that comic Cyclops lost and Cyclops officially retires. Now that was supposed to be the end of it. Right? It was supposed to be Cyclops agreeing with Madeline, I'm a husband and a father first, let's go live our life in Anchorage, Alaska. The two of them right off into the sunset, never to be seen or heard from again. But that didn't happen. And the reason why was because Jean Grey was still astronomically popular following the Phoenix and the Dark Phoenix sagas. And so Marvel brought her back. And in fact, the return of Jean Grey is the single most important plot thread 
leading into the events of Inferno in 1989. And so the return of Jean took place in Fantastic Four issue number 286. And what ended up happening here is the Fantastic Four discovered an object in the bottom of Jamaica Bay. They went down to investigate, discovered it was basically a cocoon, brought it to the surface, cracked it open, and realized Jean Grey was inside. They alert the X-Men and Jean Grey makes her triumphant return. One of the reasons why the return of Jean, to kind of sidetrack here for a second, one of the reasons why the return of Jean was so controversial at the time was because what Marvel had established here was that the last time we had actually seen the real Jean Grey was when the X-Men were coming back in a space shuttle after fighting Stephen Lang's Sentinels out in space and they were bombarded with the cosmic rays. That was it, right? That was when she actually met the Phoenix, and that was the official start of the Phoenix saga. But from the time the space shuttle came crashing down into Jamaica Bay, and Jean Grey emerged from the water in the iconic scene, I am Phoenix, and saved all the other members of the X-Men, all the way to the end of the Dark Phoenix saga when she sacrificed her life on the moon, that was never Jean. The real Jean was sitting in stasis in the bottom of Jamaica Bay, healing from the injuries that she had sustained due to her original exposure to cosmic rays. And the Phoenix Force had just taken on the appearance of Jean. As you could probably imagine, fans of Jean were pissed. They were happy to see that she was back, but they hated that none of the things that she had done actually mattered because it wasn't really her doing it. But back on track here with Madeline, this picked up in the 1985 launch of X Factor number one. Now this literally just continued on from where Uncanny X-Men 201 ended with regards to Cyclops and Madeline. What it established is that even with the two of them living in Anchorage, Alaska, Cyclops couldn't let go. It didn't really even have anything to do with Gene, right? He had long since moved past Gene. It was the fact that he missed the superhero life. More so than that, he actually ends up seeing a news broadcast on TV where they talk about the passage of the Mutant Registration Act and how the federal government is now gonna start going after the mutant population. Cyclops, right, felt just some kind of way about this, and Madeline Pryor realized this guy just doesn't really seem to be able to leave things behind. But even then, right, as the two of them are talking, talking, you find out that he is actually still thinking about Gene. And in fact, she even asked him, is it still Gene? And he says, yes. And that's really the first time that Madeline starts to realize she will always play second fiddle to Jean Grey. She'll never be number one in the life of Cyclops, always number two. But what ends up happening in X Factor number one is that Cyclops gets a call from Warren Worthington, who basically tells him, we found Jean Grey, she's alive. Cyclops leaves. Now he doesn't really tell Madeline that Jean Grey's back. He simply says, I have to go visit with Warrington. I have to go back to the life of being an X-Man. She tells him, if you go out that door, never come back. Cyclops leaves. Now the kicker about this, and really kind of reading between the lines, he abandoned his wife and child. And a lot of people who were reading X-Factor at the time hated this because they saw this as character assassination for Cyclops. The guy who was basically a Boy Scout who always kind of did the right thing nine times out of 10, no way this man would abandon his wife and child, right? No way that was ever going to happen. But the final page of X-Factor number one is Madeline Pryor sitting at their house in Anchorage, Alaska, staring at a picture of Cyclops and their son and just realizing like they've been abandoned, right? They've just been left. It was really, really sketchy, right? But the other part of this is that in X Factor, when Cyclops actually met Jean, there was no chance, right? He was never, ever gonna go back to Madeline. And in fact, for the most part, she was out of sight, out of mind. All he ever cared about was Jean Grey. And so this goes into Uncanny X-Men number 206. And this is a particularly important comic because really it's 206 and 215 that are kind of uh, really telling like a two-part story or at least a set of events that kind of come together. In Uncanny X-Men 206, Madeline Pryor just appears in a hospital with gunshot wounds and you don't really know what happened. In issue number 215, you find out that she was attacked by Mr. Sinister's Marauders. Now, this was Chris Claremont kind of building up to Inferno, right? You can kind of consider this the early prologue to the main Inferno event. But this began the process of bringing Sinister in as a guy who was part and parcel to the life of Madeline Pryor. Now, we didn't really know why he was going after Nathan Summers, right? The son of Madeline and Cyclops. We had no clue 
what was going on there. We just knew Sinister wanted this kit. At that point, you go into Uncanny X-Men 222 and 223. Now this came out in 1987, and by this point in time, Madeline Pryor doesn't know where Nathan is and no one's helping her. The reason why is because there's no records of her ever having given birth to Nathan. Those records had actually been scrubbed by Sinister right, when he initially made the attack. But everybody basically thinks Madeline's crazy by going on about a kid that she never actually had. But in this comic, right, this two, kind of two-part story here, she actually finds a sort of comfort with Alex Summers' Havoc, the brother of Cyclops. It's not really a romantic relationship, but it does become important leading into Inferno because the two of them find a kind of comfort with one another because they had both lost love interests. Havoc had lost Polaris, and she had lost Cyclops. Now, they had both experienced abandonment, although with Polaris, it was less about her going back to a former lover, and it was more about her being manipulated by the Marauders. But the fact remains, right, going into 225 and 227, this actually took place during a story called The Fall of Mutants. Now, The Fall of Mutants was more Storm and Forge-centered than anything else. For those of you guys who don't know who Forge is, he's basically a mutant whose power essentially makes him Tony Stark with the most simple and broad of explanations being given here. That's really what his abilities do. But this dealt with a guy called the Adversary and that kind of thing. The long and short of this is that the X-Men were all believed to have been dead, killed in Dallas, Texas, in a fight with the Adversary. But this was really, really important for a couple of reasons. The first was because this is how the X-Men kind of got a restart in the sense that they were visited by this woman named Roma who kind of exists beyond all space and time. She basically offered them a choice, right? You can either go back to your lives and return to them the moment that you left so no time passed at all nobody will have known what happened with the adversary or you can restart your life in secret they chose to restart their lives in secret operating out in uh, in australia by this point madeline Pryor was officially part of the x-men alongside havoc and she was by all standards of measurement his romantic partner at that point right his girlfriend but the other reason why this is important is because it revealed to cyclops what was actually going on with Madeline and Nathan, and it also led to Madeline learning why Cyclops had abandoned her in the first place. Because an important thing to know is she never knew that Cyclops had left her because Jean Grey had come back. That was a fact that she had never picked up on up to this point. In terms of Cyclops learning about her and Nathan, this was kind of the plot thread that dealt with their story of Fall of Mutants going into Inferno, that Cyclops was told by Madeline when a news crew was covering the whole fight. Literally, Madeline was talking to the news crew. She sold Cyclops, I love you. I'm sorry that things couldn't work out, yada, yada, yada. Find our son, Nathan. I don't know where he is. And then, and then like the broadcast cuts and then everybody's believed to be dead. This is when Cyclops learned that Nathan went missing. Now, as an aside here, it's kind of a sidetrack and we'll come back to the story of Madeline here in a second. But as a sidetrack, this is the story that led to Cyclops assembling X-Factor and then teaming up with the Inhumans for reasons that nobody understands because they suck. And then basically going and fighting the villain Apocalypse who had actually kidnapped Nathan and then was using him as a vessel. Nathan was infected with a techno-organic virus, no cure existed in the present day, Nathan was whisked away into the far-flung future in the hopes that a cure could be found, and Nathan grew up to become Cable. So that's how Cable gets his origin in Marvel Comics. That's where all that kind of ties together. But focusing back on Madeline Pryor here, when the X-Men themselves, with everybody believing they were dead, and even Cyclops believing they were dead, that after the whole story with Nathan going into the future and all that kind of stuff, things were basically done. There was no real connection between Cyclops and Madeline anymore. That Cyclops was living his life with Jean as part of X-Factor, Madeline was there as part of the X-Men, and for the most part, Marvel could have ended it there. Such as it was, in Uncanny X-Men 232 is really the beginning of the prologue going into Inferno that Madeline is watching a monitor where you have this interview with X-Factor. And that's the first time that she realizes Cyclops is back with Jean. Putting two and two together, she realizes Cyclops abandoned her and Nathan to return to Jean. She lashes out, loses it, destroys the monitor, and then passes out. And that's where Inferno picks up. The reason why is because in this kind of dream state that she's experiencing, specifically in Uncanny X-Men 233 and 234, she's visited by a demon named Sim from the demonic realm of Limbo. And Sim basically feeds on her emotions, right? Kind of manipulating her and telling her, we can give you the power to get back at Cyclops for abandoning you and destroying Jean for being the reason why, along with all the other X-Men, or at least members of X-Factor, for just being along for the ride, right? For just being associated with them, right? If we're being honest with ourselves. <laughs> and so Sim, alongside another demon named Nastir, 
strike a deal with Madeline. Now, this also shows Madeline kind of reaching a breaking point because despite how it may appear with her character, she's not just straight up evil. She's a character who's just struggling, right? That's the benefit of how Chris Claremont wrote Madeline. She's dealing with grief, loss, abandonment, anger, hate, all these different dark emotions. Because one thing to keep in mind is that for a time, when her and Cyclops first met and she revealed she was pregnant and Cyclops was kind of wrestling with his own things. For the most part, everything was great, right? Like they were just going to have a bright and beautiful future together. And then it all went sideways when Cyclops abandoned her. So that's why it's such a visceral and personal story when it comes to Inferno in relation to Madeline Pryor. But because she's being manipulated by these demons and also because she's just kind of stopped caring in general, she goes through what you and I might refer to as hoe phase, <laughs> right? But in all reality, she actually strikes up an affair with Alex Summers. Now, in the comic, Marvel referred to it as an affair because the marriage between her and Cyclops had never actually been nullified, right? They never really got divorced. She just stopped wearing the ring and stopped referring to herself as Cyclops' wife and just went and did her thing with Alex Summers for a while. The relationship between the two of them was incredibly strong, albeit rooted in trauma bonding. And that's the reason why during the main Inferno event, Havoc actually becomes the Goblin Prince for the Goblin Queen of Madeline Pryor, right? When she kind of takes on her demonic form. But what ends up happening, kind of going into the main Inferno story itself, specifically with Uncanny X-Men 2, 38 through 241, that's when even Madeline Pryor herself actually gets the full explanation of what her role in all of this is. If there were a plot to Inferno, which I guess there is kind of a main story, it was basically Madeline Pryor kidnapping her own son, Nathan, prior to his kidnapping by Apocalypse, you know, being taken to the future. It was her kidnapping Nathan along with eight other babies with the intention of sacrificing them to permanently open the portal between Limbo and Earth. That's kind of the main plot. Of course, that plot ended. The real meat and potatoes of Inferno is that in Uncanny X-Men 240 and 240, 41, Madeline Pryor finally gets an origin story. And what you end up learning here is that the villain, Mr. Sinister, had come to the realization that if Jean Grey and Cyclops ever had a child, that child would be godly powerful. I mean, it would be one of the most powerful mutants to ever exist in Marvel Comics. And in fact, that happened, not really in the form of Cable or even Strife, his clone, but actually in the form of Nate Gray, which has his own story, and we can go into that if you guys are interested at some future point in time. But Sinister was always trying to initiate a coupling between Jean and Cyclops. The problem is that between the Phoenix Saga, the Dark Phoenix Saga, and the death of Jean, especially during the Dark Phoenix Saga, there wasn't really a way to do this. And so Sinister cloned Jean Grey. That's Madeline Pryor. The problem with this is that as the clone of Jean, Madeline didn't really have anything about her that indicated that she was what Sinister was looking for, producing an astronomically powerful mutant. In fact, she wasn't even really alive. She just kind of was an empty vessel that existed there. And so Sinister put her in stasis and discarded her. But then you go to the death of Jean Grey on the moon in Dark Phoenix Saga, and a portion of the Phoenix Force containing some of Jean's memories ends up bonding itself to Madeline Pryor. It brings her to life. And so following that, Everything that had happened between Madeline first appearing in Uncanny X-Men 168 all the way up to Uncanny X-Men 201, her pushing Cyclops to leave the X-Men, her saying, let's take off to Anchorage, Alaska, that was all manipulation by Sinister behind the scenes. Madeline didn't know she was being manipulated. Nobody knew that Sinister was operating behind the scenes, but he was because his goal the entire time was to get the two of them to produce a child, which came in the form of Nathan. The Marauders attacking Madeline, that was Sinister looking to kidnap their kid, which he successfully did for a time. But the fact is that Madeline's story in Inferno ultimately culminates in her, once she learns this origin, basically destroying herself because she sees her life as nothing more than a tragic series of events where she met a man that she truly loved, that she truly believed she could have a beautiful life with, only for him to abandon her because she would never be number one in his life. And even abandoning her and taking off for a former lover, the true love in his life. Following that, her life was just a series of tragic events, loss, sacrifice, being manipulated by sinister, being manipulated by demons. And so from her perspective, death was a welcome option to the life that she lived. And that was really how it ended. Now, ultimately she came back, but really nothing after that is overly important. There's stories with Nate Gray, stuff like that, but this is really where Madeline peaked. 
if we're being honest with ourselves. She's just kind of free-floated through Marvel ever since and occasionally does some stuff that sort of matters sometimes, but not really. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this to an end. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments. Hopefully this helped you guys out, and I will catch you all later. Peace.